Let's finish strong with our last lecture in basic business statistics with your instructor, Dr. Todd Daniels. Well, hello, everybody. This is the week that we've been waiting for, week 16, the end of the semester. We have gone from knowing almost nothing about statistics all the way through hypothesis testing. And so I hope you've learned a lot that you're going to use as you move forward with your statistical classes. But I do want to share with you a few little details, some things that are not in the textbook, but are really important for hypothesis testing that I didn't get a good chance to cover as part of that section on the five steps of hypothesis testing. But there's more to hypothesis testing than what I covered, or maybe there's more depth to hypothesis testing than what I covered. So I want to focus on three things that are, are important to know about hypothesis testing. You remember in step one, we were choosing the appropriate statistic, the test that we were going to use based upon our data. And I encouraged you to check the assumptions for the test. I want to dig a little deeper into what I mean by checking the assumptions. What, what are those assumptions? Why do they matter? And then the second thing I want to look at is statistical significance, because you remember we have to make a decision. Is this test statistically significant or not? So it's going to be important that you understand what exactly do we mean by statistical significance. I'm going to dwell on that a little bit. And it may not mean exactly what you think it means. And then finally, I'm going to tell you about effect sizes. But I want to introduce you to the topic so you will know why we use effect sizes and why it's important to be able to report them for all of our hypothesis testing. So we're going to begin with this exploration of assumptions and the importance of checking the assumptions of your hypothesis test before you begin. So imagine that you try to call me on my cell phone. And when you call, the cell phone just goes, rolls right over to voicemail and you're not able to get through. And you, you try in the morning, in the mid-morning, the afternoon, late afternoon, all day long, you've tried to call, and every time the call goes to voicemail. Why was I not picking up? If you make an assumption that the reason why I have not been answering your calls is because I don't wanna to talk to you. I'm hitting that button that sends you to voicemail. I'm avoiding your calls what might you begin to feel? Your conclusion, based upon the assumption that I'm avoiding your calls, you might be angry with me. But if you discovered later on, when we were finally able to talk face to face, that that morning I had forgotten to bring my cell phone to work with me. I had left it on the charger at home. It, it had died the night before. I left it charging overnight. I was in a hurry to get going that next morning. Just completely spaced it out left the phone at home. I didn't have my phone with me. If your assumption about why I wasn't answering your calls was incorrect, then any conclusion that you draw from that assumption can be incorrect. Same thing is true with hypothesis tests. Every test is built on certain assumptions about the normality of the data or the presence or absence of outliers. And if those assumptions have been violated, then any conclusions you draw about statistical significance can be mistaken. Well then, what are the assumptions for the various tests that we would use? I'm just gonna go through these briefly. Again, my purpose here is just to introduce these ideas to you so you'll have them in your head as you move forward learning more about statistics. We'll start with the assumption of having scale level dependent data. This is something that's absolutely necessary for dependent variable scores if you are going to create means. If you do not have scale level dependent data, dependent variable data, you can use a non-parametric test. And this is something that's easy to check for during your research construction. It's easily verified. Just look at the data. Make sure you've measured something as you've created this research design. Now the second assumption is independence. We just want to make sure we have independent instead of correlated scores. Each score in our data set is independent of the others. You haven't sampled one person and then that person's brother or gotten people from the same family to answer the, the questionnaire or just called all of your Facebook friends and asked them to answer the survey. 
where there may be a relationship in their, the way that they answer the items. This is also something we can do during research construction, and we can use good random sampling techniques to help increase the likelihood that we have independent scores. If we do not have independent scores, we can use a paired or related samples technique for analyzing the data. So a paired t-test instead of an independent samples t-test. Outliers can greatly mess with your analysis, so it's important that we check for outliers. Univariate outliers, or outliers on one particular variable, can be legitimate, and we might want to leave them in the data set. If someone is exceptionally tall, they're an outlier, but that was just part of the random selection of the people that are in our sample. That can happen through random chance. On the other hand, we may have something like an extremely high income that's skewing our data. And what we might do when we have a univariate outlier where one score is particularly high is we'll just trim that score back. It's called Windsorizing. We'll just bring it down to the next highest reasonable score with the rest of our data. And that removes the leverage of the outlier while still leaving that as the highest score in our data set. If, however, we have multivariate outliers, those we have to remove from our data set. Now, multivariate outliers can be identified using a Mahalanobis test. This is a test that we'll learn about in applied business statistics, but it simply allows you to tell whether someone has extreme scores on multiple variables. And if so, that is really going to distort our findings, create additional leverage. That person is going to exert leverage on the outcome scores. So that's a, a score that we have to remove from our analysis. Let's talk about missing data. Just like being on safari in Africa, wandering through the underbrush, it's the lion that you don't see that eats you. With missing data, it's the data that we don't have that can really come back and bite us. So it is important that we check for missing data before we do our analysis. We want to get an idea of why those data are missing, and that will give us a clue as to what we can do about it. Let's walk through some options. We can use list-wise deletion, which is where we have cases with any missing data. They have any missing data points. They're just simply removed from the analysis. Now, of course, that's going to reduce your sample size. So this is recommended only if you have 5% or fewer of your cases with missing data. Second option is pairwise deletion, which is where you remove the cases only from the analyses where they have missing data. That sounds like a good compromise. However, what that will do is leave you with different sample sizes for various analyses. So you run your first t-test and there's 100 participants there, but then you run a correlation, there's only 96 participants there. Your sample size fluctuates throughout your analysis because there's different numbers of people in each analysis. Another way that we could deal with missing data is to fill in the blanks, maybe using an educated guess. So if you are looking at a subscale where one person has answered, let's say on a scale of one to five, they've answered three, four, missing number, and four. You could probably make an educated guess as to what kind of score would go into that blank. Maybe a three, maybe a four, maybe a 3.5, but you can come up with a number that's much more realistic. You know that it's probably not gonna be a five or a one. You can make an educated guess on what should go into that blank. Mean substitution is where you simply substitute the mean for a series. Now we could go one of three ways with this. We could substitute the mean for the whole variable. We just get the average for that particular variable, substitute that for the missing value, Although what that is going to do is reduce the variability for that variable, it's actually gonna make it harder to find statistical significance if we have lots of missing data. Or we could use the mean of the subscale rather than the entire variable. Or we could use the mean for that individual. But all of these are, let's say, second-rate ways of imputing the data. If you do not have any other options, 
then this is the fallback position. But if you possibly can, using a different form of imputation is much more advised. Regression substitution is one way. You create a regression equation and you use that number as the missing variable value. Or we use multiple imputation where we have multiple rounds of predictions. Those are averaged. It gives us a single score. Now, this is the best and most desirable way to replace missing data, but it takes a lot of time, work. It's difficult to do depending upon the, the type of software that you're using. So it is a gold standard, but it is pretty cumbersome to get to these missing data points using multiple imputation. The assumption of normality is that the dependent variable, the scaled data, are normally distributed. We can get to this through graphs, like a QQ plot or a histogram, or through numbers like a komolgorov smirnov test. But it's important to remember the assumption is not really that the dependent variable itself is normally distributed, but rather that the dependent variable is drawn from a population whose distribution of sample means is normally distributed. Even if the distribution of the actual dependent variable is not normally distributed, if you have a large sample size, at least 30, the more skewed your data are, the larger the sample size you'd want to use. Better if you have 50 or 100. But if you have a large enough sample size, then the test that we use will be robust to violations of normality for this particular, for any of the tests that we use. Homogeneity of variance is about the variability within two groups. We just want to make sure that variability is equal. We wouldn't want to have a circumstance where we have a platycurtic distribution and a leptocurtic distribution for the two groups that we're comparing because that variability, the difference in the variability, is going to make it more difficult to find statistical significance or probably more accurately, we may make a type one or a type two error that we wouldn't have made if we had the, this, if this assumption had not been violated. We can check for homogeneity of variance using Levine's test when we're doing a t-test, but the most important thing to know is that the homogeneity of variance assumption is another one that if we have a large enough sample size, the t-test the or the ANOVA will be robust to this violation. Now it's important that we have, if we have a violation, it's just one. So for instance, if there's a violation for normality and there's a violation for homogeneity of variance, uh, then larger sample sizes uh, probably shouldn't be counted upon to overcome those limitations. But if there is one assumption that has been violated and you have a large enough sample size, then the good news is these parametric statistics are robust, which means that we can use statistics like t-tests and ANOVAs even when some of the, the assumptions have been violated, particularly the violations are not bad and we have a large sample size. Non-parametric statistics are the alternative for the parametric statistics that we're learning about. Each of the parametric statistics, like a t-test, will have a non-parametric alternative test that we could use in case the assumptions were violated so badly that we simply couldn't use a parametric test. The advantage of a non-parametric test is that the requirements for doing the test are not as stringent. They don't require the same assumptions. So if we have nominal or ordinal data, or if we have scale data that's highly skewed, we could use a non-parametric test as an alternative. However, non-parametric tests are not as powerful, meaning they're not as likely to find statistical significance. So we still want to be sure we have a large enough sample size to account for that. So that was the first of the three ideas that I want to share with you. Next, we're going to talk about statistical significance and what statistical significance really means.